Neon Genesis Evangelion presents us with a world in turmoil. Conflict is ever present and history is being written. Among the life-threatening angel attacks, a post-apocalyptic breakdown of society and the struggle of puberty and human connection, Shinji finds himself in a truly unfortunate predicament. Yes, indeed, it is as German philosopher of the early 19th century Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel says, history is not the soil in which happiness grows. The periods of happiness in it are the blank pages of history. These times demand of Shinji to be a hero, to fight in the name of humanity as a protector. Being forced into this predicament by his father, by the expectations of the women in his life and ultimately also by his self-image. This unhappiness of history necessitates or creates the hero. Once the state has been founded, there can no longer be any heroes. They come on the scene only in uncivilized conditions. A lack of state can be found everywhere in Eva. Not only in the constant failures to adequately deal with crisis and to protect its citizens, but also in a general lack of societal order. And even the few authority figures we have seem powerless in the face of ruthless and destructive attacks of the angels. Eva uses this destroyed and orderless external world to mirror the aimlessness, the alienation and the disorientation of its characters, who in their pursuit for a human connection hurt each other, subject each other to depend on another's validation and only try to resolve the contradiction of their desire for closeness and their inherent potential to hurt each other. The Hedgehog's Dilemma on one side, but it is also something we can describe with Hegel's master and slave dialectic. Not only is there an amazing post on the Eva Geeks forum explaining how the ending of the series and the movie are connected through precisely this dialectic, but traces of it are all throughout Eva. To put it very simply, the master and slave dialectic functions twofold. First, to outline a subject's psychological development of concepts of self and other. The self is only aware of itself through a distinction, through an other to perceive, an other that can see you, react to you, that you can see is distinct from you. But the other is also a threat. The other is not me, it is my negation. The contact with the other will result in fear of not being recognized by them, which turns you into the slave. And the master is the one who instills the fear and shapes the slave, but thereby also only existing in dependence on the slave's fear and recognition. Philosophy Tube in his video on Hegel outlined exactly this act in a little play, in which he presents it as a monologue. I'll link the video in the description below, please check it out for more information. This process of thesis and antithesis in conflict is called dialectics. And Hegel's opinion on those is, Truth is found neither in thesis nor in antithesis, but in an emergent synthesis which reconciles the two. The synthesis would then be the resolving of the master and slave relationship, but how would that look? Well, before we get to that, let's first get to the other function of the master and slave dialectic. Hegel's book Phenomenology of Spirit from which this master and slave dialectic is taken explains the process of history through the evolution of a spirit throughout the course of human civilization with the ultimate goal of reaching the end of history. In this book, master and slave dialectic can be applied to all social relations, to all conflicting ideas, to all disorder and chaos. The sublation of thesis and antithesis in synthesis is a way to find the truth, the definite answers. And once arrived at that truth, world spirit or the end of history will be achieved. By the end of history, Hegel interpreters do not mean that the events of history will come to an end, something akin to an end of the world scenario. Rather, the end of history means that the goal of history has been realized, the achievement of the consciousness of freedom. And all that remains is to make it universal. It is not true that all people are free, but the conditions now exist whereby all can be made free, for example. So how is this made universal? How does this resolve the personal psychological layer of the master and slave dialectic? Well, you've seen the show. You might already have an idea. Instrumentality. The boundaries between all selves and others disappear, and they flow together into a literal synthesis. But not only the individual people, but everyone. All systems, all struggles, all conflicts, all expectations, all lovers, all friends, all those who betrayed, hurt, and misunderstood each other flow into one. All that conflict is solved. The visionary who brought forth the spirit realm was Gendo Ikari. 
resolving human misunderstanding, chaos and disorder forever by synthesizing them into one cohesive whole. The consciousness of freedom from the master and slave dialectic in a universal synthesis. In the last two episodes of the TV series then we see Shinji inside of the instrumentality goo resolve all his misunderstandings with people around him, understanding how they perceived him all this time, and how he perceived them only from his standpoint all this time. All good, right? Humanity solved, right? Wrong. Enter the unique. We do not aspire to communal life, but to a life apart. And man has not really vanquished shamanism and its spooks till he possesses the strength to lay aside not only the belief in ghosts or in spirits, but also the belief in spirit. These quotes are from German mid 19th century philosopher Max Stirner, a radical, often forgotten philosopher who actually studied under Hegel, but came to radically reject a lot of his ideas about history, about the self, about society, and most importantly, about the goal of history. Stirner can be considered a radical individualist. For him, the transcending figure of the self, or the unique, was his basis for all of this philosophy, explaining everything through the lens of self-interest and self-actualization, as well as defining freedom through nothing but the absence of those which limit the self's potential to create itself. Different from Hegel's idea of freedom, which was rooted in the idea of a spirit that will lead to universal truth through the synthesis of different dialectics, Sterner rejected any truth that is not arising from the self, a radical relativism versus Hegel's universalism. He sees the belief in spirit, like Hegel does, as nothing but shamanism, spooks that haunt the individual and make them betray their self in the name of lofty imaginations. Man, your head is haunted. You have wheels in your head. You imagine great things and depict to yourself a whole world of gods that has an existence for you, a spirit realm to which you suppose yourself to be called, an ideal that beckons to you. You have a fixed idea. You can imagine this being directly addressed to Gendo Ikari quite easily. And truly, in the name of changing the world, Gendo has acted like a god. And God only cares for what is his, busies himself with only himself, thinks only of himself and has only himself before his eyes. He serves no higher person and satisfies only himself. His cause is a purely egoistic cause. So then how does Stirner approach the situation, this ever-present confusion? Well, he sees it as something natural, of course amplified in Eva, but from the moment when he catches sight of the light of the world, a man seeks to find out himself and get hold of himself, out of its confusion in which he, with everything else, is tossed about in motley mixture. In life there is chaos, confusion, everything is mixed about. And in all this confusion, our project is to find ourselves, mirrored in Shinji's search for who he actually is throughout the entire show, struggling by defining himself through another, through another's expectations and perception of him, perceiving himself as if he was another. Why are his roles as a pilot, as a son, not ever reaching a self, but only as Shinji as others see him, constantly trying to rise up to the expectations of him? measuring his worth only through those means. But according to Stirner, the true human being doesn't lie in the future, an object of longing, but rather it lies in the present, existing and actual. However and whoever I may be, joyful and sorrowful, a child or an old man, in confidence or doubt, asleep or awake, I am it, I am the true human being. He is saying to Shinji that he is not who others expect of him, and also not who he himself thinks he has to become. But he's only himself. Right now, right there. The actual lived experience of the boy Shinji is who he is. This is also something Shinji realizes when he proclaims, I am me. He realizes this through the experience of instrumentality, something that robs him of his selfness, of his lived experience of being Shinji by becoming part of a mass. Let's entertain for a moment the idea of the instrumentality as the end of history, as in the supposedly objective truths and laws and morals and universal state as Hegel saw it. What Stirner had to say was the following. It is possible I can make very little of myself, but this little is everything and better than what I allow to be made out of me by the might of others, by the training of custom, religion, the laws, the state. Stirner is saying he that he believes that what he can achieve through self-actualization 
will transcend anything that any law could put on him. Whoever will be free must make himself free. Freedom is no fairy gift to fall into man's lap. What is freedom? To have the will to be responsible for oneself. He sees freedom in the ability to take responsibility of yourself, of your own lived experience, to remove yourself as far as possible from the definition through others, and to not allow yourself to be swallowed up by the will of a larger world spirit. For you will lose something essential. You will lose yourself. The self that struggles to create itself, to realize its full potential. But at least you will be able to have that struggle, instead of becoming merely a drop of goop in the vast oceans of instrumentality. Shinji realizes that himself, choosing to step out of it, to manifest back into himself. What he is doing is he is undoing spiritual suicide. He is willing himself back into life. He is taking responsibility for himself. The Eva Geeks post I mentioned before then can explain in detail to you why Shinji chokes Asuka in this scene. The re-emergence of the dialectics, the struggle to define oneself. It might not be possible to escape it fully, but there's something vital in the attempt to do so anyways. Namely, that you will be able to keep being yourself. Revolution and insurrection must not be looked upon as synonymous. The former consists in an overturning of conditions of the established condition or status, the state or society, and is accordingly a political or social act. The latter has indeed for its unavoidable consequence a transformation of circumstances, yet does not start from it, but from man's discontent of us themselves. It's not an armed rising, but a rising of individuals, a getting up, without regard to the arrangements that spring from it. The revolution aimed at new arrangements. Insurrection leads us no longer to let ourselves be arranged, but to arrange ourselves, and sets no glittering hopes on institutions. It is not a fight against the established, since if it prospers, the established collapses of itself. It is only a working forth of me, out of the established. If I leave the established, it is dead and passes into decay. Instrumentality is a revolution that put on a new societal order. But only Shinji taking responsibility for himself and escaping from this order is him refusing to let himself be arranged by it. Freeing himself, opening himself up to a process of constant renewal, constant struggle and constant self-actualization. Therein he finds the life worth living, unlike the death-like state of instrumentality. Therein he finds freedom. This ends part one of my video series where I will be looking at instrumentality and especially Shinji's decision to escape from it through multiple philosophical and psychological angles. Next up is gonna be a look at it through a Freudian lens, considering death drive and contrasting it with Albert Camus' Man in the Revolt.